This episode of Touch MBA is brought to you by Prodigy Finance, the leader in education loans for international postgraduate students. Visit prodigyfinance.com to learn more. Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, welcome to the Touch MBA Podcast. This is your host, Darren. Glad to have you here. This week, I interviewed Yuan Li Chung, who is an alumni of the HKUST MBA. HKUST is one of the top ranked MBA programs in Asia, very well known. And Yuan Li actually spent 12 months there and then went on an exchange to Columbia University for one term. I really enjoyed this conversation. Yuan Li is super candid. And I think that those of you who are considering top Asian MBA programs need to listen to this entire episode all the way through. There's just so much good stuff in this one. Now, Yuan Li shares a lot of insights you can't find anywhere else. And I realized that this was a big problem for a lot of students. So we started this new initiative called the Ambassadors Forum. And the idea is basically this. It's so difficult to get a good read on what the culture is like at an MBA program, what the student experience is like at an MBA program especially in, in, in Asia and Europe. So we started this ambassadors forum so that you could ask students and recent alumni of these top programs your questions. This is at ambassadors.touchmba.com. We're hoping to start the best forum where you can get just great insights about schools themselves. So it's not focused on admissions, but really focused on helping you with school selection and getting a better idea of what these programs are really, really like. So you could go check that out at ambassadors.touchmba.com. At Touch MBA, we're all about helping you find uh, great schools that fit what you're looking for, that are, are worth your, your time and money. So if you need free school selection help, go head over to touchmba.com. We'd be happy to help you out there for free. And now here's my conversation with Yuan Li. In this week's episode, I have a special guest. It's our first MBA alumni from a top MBA program in Asia. So Yuan Li Chung went to the HKUST MBA program. And I can't wait to talk to her and, and learn more about her experience and and why she chose the school and so forth. So Yuan Li, thank you so much for joining the show. And thanks for having me, Darren. So just a brief introduction about myself. My name is Yuan Li. I'm originally from Malaysia. I've worked and lived in Singapore a long time. So a, a lot of people have mistaken my accent for Singaporean. I guess it's an inevitable uh, side effect. And about uh, three years ago, I decided to uproot um, and move to Hong Kong to do my MBA at HKUST. So prior to the MBA, I used to work um, in asset management at UBS and uh, Capital Group. And now I am helping a German media company do corporate venture uh, capital investments in, in Asia. My first question is, I mean, it sounds like, you know, you had some really uh, excellent work experience in Singapore b- before deciding to get your MBA. So why did you choose to go to HKUST? And uh, we've talked about this before, but I know you were thinking about LBS and IMD and Chicago Booth and INSEAD, all very big names as well. Um, So I'm wondering why you decided to apply to a top Asian business school over those other schools. So I'll start with first the motivations for doing an MBA myself. I graduated with an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering. So when when I graduated, I think the plan wasn't really to go into finance, which is what I did ultimately. And over the years, I felt that although my career is progressing um, decently, um, I felt like I still lacked some of the key training from a basic business education. That I, and, and that was something that I really wanted for myself as a, um, as a personal development point. So even while I was at Capital Group, the, the thought of doing the, an MBA was already there. What came next was more of a question of how did I want to do it? Because... I could have done a part-time program while I worked at Capital Group. There were a few 
very good um, MBA programs available in Singapore. But the more I, I talk to people and the more I got the advice, especially from my senior colleagues and peers, that if I could afford it, I really should quit and do the program full time because the experience is very different from um, doing the MBA part time. Um, there's a, I guess you can say, a deeper immersion experience from being a, amongst your classmates um, 24-7 for, for two full years. The kind of opportunities that you can access is also different. And I mean, on top of that, an opportunity to move somewhere new, to experience new culture, a new work environment is something that I think is uh, a lot of people tend to underestimate. So that led to which MBA program. Um, and I was specifically looking for a program where my peers were about my level of experience, so about like seven years, seven, eight years experience. Um, I was also looking specifically for a program with a small class size. Um, I've been part of a larger tertiary education system before where your, your cohort size is like a class of 500 students. And I really wanted to experience what it would be like to be in a more intimate class setting. So that pretty much led my, me narrowing down the choices to uh, a few schools because there are not very many MBA schools that provide small class sizes. HKUST and IMD were the, some of the top schools there. I've also included LBS and INSEAD uh, by sheer sure virtue of their international, um, the international nature of their program. And ultimately, I decided on HKUST because uh, I felt that it was the best fit for me in terms of the class size, um, the, the exposure to Asia. Plus, I like the fact that the school had a very flexible part-time, full-time program where, you know, if after coming to Hong Kong, let's say I found an opportunity that I really liked, I could switch to a part-time program if I really wanted. And for me, where I was at that point in my career, if I would find a suitable opportunity, which I think would have been pretty it would have been quite likely. I wanted at least that flexibility to switch so that I'm not putting myself at a disadvantage by saying that, you know, I can't start this great job right now because I, I, I need another year to graduate. Did you visit all of these universities as well? Or how did you get to know more about them? For INSEAD, because it was in my backyard, you know, it was quite easy. I've attended some of the uh, info sessions on campus. I also know a lot of the alumni um, and current students personally. So that actually that INSEAD was the first school that I learned about and that inspired me to do an MBA. So um, it's ironic that ultimately I did not go to INSEAD. Um, but for LBS, HKUST and IMD, um, a lot of the research that I had to do was uh, pretty much on my own online. Um, sometimes, uh, I mean, very often try calling in and listening to their info sessions. Ultimately, you know, some of the resources that I found the most useful were online forums and discussion panels, just like what you're creating right now with Touch MBA. So ironically, the, I think the forums that I found the most useful, uh, one of them was uh, Pagal Guy, which was actually catered for Indian students based in India. But they are very thorough in researching all these schools and they had a lot of information there. And so although I'm not typically considered a uh, target audience for, for that forum, I managed to glean quite a lot of information from that site. Yeah, and, and just uh, just a little plug, um, Yuen Li has graciously volunteered to be one of our ambassadors um, in our ambassadors forum. Uh, that's at ambassadors.touchmba.com. And so that's what I've been trying to do is assemble these great people that are willing to share their experiences with you guys uh, to make it a little bit easier because best way to learn about a school is to actually talk to real, real people, real, real students that, that have been there. Because a school is really just a collection of smart, ambitious people on the faculty side, on the student side, on the alumni side, on the program managing side, on the career service side. So that's why uh, meeting the people of a program is so important. So you explained to us why you narrowed down your choice to HKUST. Uh, obviously, you, you, you got in. What do you think was the best part of the program for you? The best part of the program for me is definitely the, my peers, being in the class of my peers. Um, and I don't mean people with just the same kind of uh, background or years of experience as I have. I think something that I observed um, about a lot of the MBA schools these days is um, fit is a very important criteria for selection. Right? It's, no, it's, not, it's not enough anymore to have the best GMAT scores or a stellar CV. I think how, what your personality is like, what you're looking for, what your priorities are in life 
also matters a lot in the selection process um, because there is a certain culture, there's a certain uh, mindset each school is trying to, to cultivate. And the, the best part of HKUST for me is being amongst others that were, that were equally curious, driven, with the same kind of risk appetite as I have. Risk appetite and curiosity for working in emerging markets. I think this is something that um, a lot of people don't realize, but you know, in, to select a school in Asia, to, firstly, it must mean that you already have some kind of um, curiosity or desire to be part of this, the, the growing Asia story. You know, it doesn't matter where you come from, you can be Asian yourself or you could, you could, you could not be, but there's, there's a lot of fascination about the market and there's so much opportunity to be, uh, to, to be had. Right? And, and in order to be able to be comfortable with that, you need to have a certain kind of personality. And I think with my classmates, I found that we were all generally very open-minded people, people who were very accustomed to working with different cultures or being around very different people. Um, and I really enjoyed that. Um, I learned a lot from them. The other part is obviously the, the faculty and the experience that they've had that was very deeply rooted in Asia. Um, I think this is something um, one other aspect that I found unique about HKUST that in spite of some of the more international programs abroad or more other business schools claiming that they have you know, programs specifically catered to understanding China or India, it's, it's very different from having one module that's only dedicated to China versus your entire program where talking about companies like Tata Steel or Alibaba or Tencent is a, is a, is a normal thing. So that's, that's the other thing that I, I feel that I... I enjoyed the most about HKUST. You know, it's interesting because I know that you also studied abroad. You spent one term at Columbia, which obviously is a huge MBA name. So I was wondering how your experience at HKUST compared with your experience at Columbia. It was a very interesting contrast for me uh, because I went from, for me, going to HKUST and picking a, a small format school was intentional. So going to Colombia and being one out of 700 students was a huge change. I think it was that change of uh, transitioning between being part of a small community where everyone knows everyone. We even know like, how we, each of us tick, right? It's, it's small enough for you to know each other on a personal level. And going to this program where you're just part of a huge mass of people. And I know that for Colombia students, they feel that they're still part of a smaller community because they all and they were broken down to smaller clusters. But as an exchange student, I guess we, we have a different perspective because we are coming in after the fact and we can observe the, the class as a whole. And so I find that the teaching or the, the experience tends to be very, very mass. A lot of things are done on a, on a very high level that, that's meant to be catered to as many people as possible. That's the first one. The second one um, that I felt was a big difference, and I think this pretty much lends itself to any Asian business Asian school versus um, Western school is obviously the American students are very outspoken. There's a very heavy emphasis on class participation and you know the amount of engagement that was going on there was 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 really exciting because um, you have a lot of people very eager to participate and while you don't get as much of that at HKUST, what we do have a lot of is a lot of discussions outside of the classroom. Right. So it is not that that discussion is not taking place. It is taking place, but it may not necessarily happen in the classroom itself. And so I think that was some a big difference that I saw between between the two schools. What I learned about Colombia was the US schools are really good at what they do. There are certain things that they do that I think definitely is better than than Asia. If you are in the finance industry like I was, I think in terms of learning more advanced or more sophisticated um, finance, financial instruments or techniques or things like that is something that you can probably only find in the more developed schools in the US or perhaps in LBS. In Asia, although we do have like Singapore and Hong Kong are considered the finance hubs, but I think the access to specialized financial education tends to come more from the masters in, in finance courses, not so much from the MBA, whereas in the West or in, in these MBA programs, MBA has become so synonymous with uh, finance professionals that you, you get that kind of access and you get that kind of exposure. So I would say that's one of the other major differences that I saw. Now, that's a super interesting perspective because I think one problem, you know, in terms of getting good information about MBA programs is 
people usually just go to one program and that's really all they can talk about. So I think it's really interesting to hear you compare these two elite um, institutions. One point I, I got to get on my soapbox and just say this to my audience is that uh, one really interesting part to me, at least, about the top Asian MBA programs is many of them have outstanding exchange relationships. So you can spend that one term in Columbia or UCLA or LBS or you know other top schools in Europe in the U.S., but you are paying Asian MBA tuition prices, which are generally lower. So I think that's kind of a neat arbitrage opportunity uh, for those of you who still want to get that U.S. experience or, or European experience on your resume as well. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. Another thing I wanted to ask you about was the alumni network of HKUST. You know, HKUST is a top-ranked uh, Asian MBA program. What is that alumni network like? That's a very broad question. Maybe I should ask more specifically, did you find it easier? Did you find it easy to engage with alumni? And how involved are the alumni in the actual educational experience? I think the alumni network is something that we get asked about a lot. I'll be very frank about that. HKUST being a uh, business school, having a, an MBA program that's only 25 years old and with a class size that's, um, that has grown to 100 today or 120 today, obviously means that we have an alumni network that's very small, right? It's very small, I guess, to some extent, very selective. In fact, recently I met um, an alumni from the very first intake of uh, the MBA program and I was surprised to learn that I think it was only a class of 10 or 20 people that was uh, subsidized to, to a heavy extent by the Hong Kong government because the Hong Kong government was trying to stimulate this uh, interest in MBA in Hong Kong. And it was really interesting to hear from his perspective and also for me to realize that for him from the first batch where there was only 10 or 20 people to become where we are today at 120, people today look at us at, as a 120-person program thinking that, oh, you know, you're small, not very developed, but they forget that it's, an, it's a growth that's happened over 25 years, and 25 years is a very short history for an MBA program. In general, I would say most of our alumni are situated or located in Hong Kong. So if you want to find an opportunity in Hong Kong or network in Hong Kong, we have a very strong network here. But don't get me wrong, we also have alumni elsewhere in the world, other parts of Asia like Singapore, Japan, Indonesia, we have a small community, there are Philippines. We also have people in Europe and the U.S. And it goes without saying that as the program progresses, that, that the alumni network will grow. And I think the fact that because we all came from a, an environment where the network is small and community is small and that we all know each other, we naturally tend to relate to each other on a more personal level as well. So for, for us, like for example, even though I'm part of a full-time program, it doesn't mean that my network is limited within the full-time program or within the MBA program per se. I think the HKUST school on a broad level has, is doing a lot of work to keep their alumni engaged. So even if I'm abroad, I travel a lot for work, for example. I go a lot to Europe, to, to Asia, and I try to make an effort that every city I go to, I connect with alumni there. What surprises me a lot is how open alumni are to meeting obviously if and when they have the time but how open they are to meet me even if they may not know me very well or if I may be connected to versus a true faculty for example because I may have asked for an introduction or you know etc etc and and that's something that I think is particularly unique about HKUST I know obviously with some of the bigger schools you have a very broad network and you can reach these people um, but it all, always of course becomes a question of how willing are they to respond to you and to connect with you, right? I think here we have a network that's personal enough or intimate enough for us to relate to each other on a, on, on a level that's beyond we are associated to the same school. In, in terms of the reputation of MBAs in the Hong Kong job market and in the finance industry, because that's where you are, and I think that's where a lot of people who want to study in Hong Kong want to move into, how were you able to, to find your job? Or maybe if you could just take a step back and tell us what you're doing, because I know you were targeting like venture capital. First, tell us what you're doing now and then kind of how you were able to find that job and, and what the difficulties or obstacles or, or good parts were of being an MBA. So what I do today is I'm helping a media company grow out their investments into consumer internet companies in Asia. 
My company is a 100 plus year old family owned business that's primarily worked in print products and magazine publishing. Um, it's had a very, very long history. You know, they're a very well established brand in, in Germany. And about 20 years ago, they started investing into internet companies. And where they are today, uh, they've managed to diversify more than half of their revenues into digital, which is, I think, which is a feat that not very many media companies can successfully say they've managed to do. And my job today is to help them replicate basically that kind of success they had in Europe, here in Asia. Because what we have in Asia still is uh, predominantly the traditional businesses. I help them look for interesting investment opportunities here that would make interesting investments from a portfolio perspective. I guess to some extent that lends a little bit from my past experience in investments. Um, but I do borrow a lot from the skills that I've picked up during the MBA. I think the MBA had a very large part to do with how I managed to find this opportunity that I have today. Firstly, because from what I was doing before, it would have not been possible for me to make this, this transition. And the MBA has equipped me with a lot of new skills, a lot of, uh, a lot of understanding, especially about uh, M&A, tech investments, about start, the startup market in general. And this is, I think in general, the whole um, tech investment space in Asia is a very new thing. It's probably, it's quite developed in the US now, but in Asia it's very new. So for those of us who were probably, who, I mean, it, like myself, I began my career about, eight, about 10 years ago. At that point in time, tech and entrepreneurship was almost not talked about. No one knew about it, no one talked about it. And so I, I would say most of my peers who still stay within large organizations today probably hear about it, they read about it in the news, but they don't really know what it was about. But going back to school and doing the MBA and meeting peers from the US who have worked in Silicon Valley or um, having the opportunity to network with all these other new people exposed me to new things and made me realize that, hey, you know, this is uh, something really exciting and interesting that I, I would want to get, I, would, I want to know more about and perhaps pursue a career in. So that's, that's how I managed to land that opportunity. In terms of the reputation of MBAs in the Hong Kong market, um, I had to ask around for this because obviously, you know, I, I don't want to just give my point of view. And I would say the key words that I got from my peers were underappreciated but catching up. MBAs don't pull the same weight in Hong Kong as they would in the US. It's still a very nascent uh, concept with a lot of local employers, especially local companies. But it is valued, especially amongst um, foreign employers and especially for positions where you, know, you need a certain level of seniority and a certain level of expertise in terms of management or strategy development. In the finance industry, I see that it is generally an appreciated degree because it enables a lot of people to switch into finance or it's traditionally been a, an avenue for people to switch into finance and that still holds true in Hong Kong. But I think if local employers had, had their way, they'd be more than happy to just take anyone else with, the, with comparable amount of experience over an MBA. And that puts MBA candidates in Hong Kong in a, in a very interesting position. It means you've got to be much hungrier. You've got to be much more competitive. You, you need to be much smarter in accessing the opportunities that you want because your competition is not other MBAs. Your competition is basically the broader market out there and you really need to dig deep down to ask what are you offering about yourself that is going to be enticing to an employer beyond the MBA. Now that is, I uh, really appreciate that, those candid reflections and I think it's even exaggerated even more by the nature of Hong Kong and how open of a, a market it is for talent. No, but that's that's a really good encouragement, I think, for, for our listeners. In terms of clubs and leadership activities, if we can kind of switch gears, I know you're vice president of, of your class. So how, how active are those clubs and how big of a role do they play in terms of both the academic experience and the sort of career experience? Because in the U.S., they're really big for the career experience. I know that for sure. In, in what sense, like in terms of accessing opportunities? Yeah, so if you want to get into the entertainment industry and you're going to UCLA Anderson, you better join that entertainment club because you know that's how you can meet a lot of the alums in the industry, for example. I would say the same pretty much holds true in Hong Kong and in HKUST. So the way our program is structured at HKUST can sometimes mean that it's awkward for clubs. I'll be very honest about that. 
So the program at HKAC, you have an option to do either a 12 or 16 month program with or without exchange, which means that because they give you so much option of your class of uh, 100 to 120 peers, you may find that some people finish a program very quickly. In fact, the, the more ambitious one can even finish it in 10 months if they really cram. That means unlike in the US where as a first year MBA student, when you enter the MBA program, you have a situation where the second years are there already holding leadership of the clubs and they are basically helping you groom into introduce you, show you the ropes and things like that, right? There are a lot of good things about that. They hand over the ropes. They hand over a lot of uh, contacts. They are around to provide guidance and mentorship, which I think for a program like HKUST, we've lost out a little bit on because obviously with every year, since there's very little overlap between the first and the second year, some things get lost. We do make an effort to try to hand on as much as you can, but because from year to year, interest in clubs vary greatly since you have like only 100 students, so you have some things that come and go, right? But certain clubs are, are there all the time. It's like finance clubs always there, business in China, the Japan club, consulting, for example. Some of these specific areas of focuses are always there. What this means is that because there's flux, there's a lot of opportunity to come in and to create something new if you want. I think the year after me, we had some very passionate gamers. I don't know if it started as a joke or if, if it's something that they were generally, you know, they really felt it was uh, legitimate, but they managed to set up a gamers club, which, you know, you can think of it as frivolous, but to some extent, it's also interesting because you, there are some games that require a lot of strategy, right? So strategy shouldn't just be limited to the MBA program. Why not have fun thinking about strategy in terms of games? So that's what they created. And there was no precedent. No one said that they couldn't do it. Basically, you have an idea. You go through a whole pitch day. And the whole exercise of pitching your idea, selling that idea, trying to create a club, I think it is an entrepreneurial endeavor in itself. You know, you need to find a way or you need to first figure out, is there a market for your club? Is there demand for your club? How are you going to rally support and funds for your club? How after that? you maintain operations, things like that. So I think clubs and leaderships in HKUC definitely lends a lot to finding jobs for some of these clubs because of who you access through the club. But I think more importantly, it gives you a real-time opportunity to exercise the business and the management skills that we all go to an MBA school for. And for me, being part of the um, MBA association, which is sort of like the student council for, my, for the class, was a real test in leadership, I would say, because the terminology that we like to use is leading a whole class of MBA students is like trying to herd cats. Everyone has a, you know, their own ideas, they all want to go their own way, and it, it, it's really challenging to get everyone to galvanize together to work on, on a single thing. Wow, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure it was. And kind of related uh, to that note in terms of finding jobs, what about your classmates who maybe didn't have uh, a background in Asia or maybe a background in Mandarin or Cantonese? Was their job search more difficult because of the language? The honest answer is yes, definitely yes. I think it's no surprise. I, it, should, it should not come to a surprise to candidates who want to come to Hong Kong. Before you even come to Hong Kong, all you have to do is just go online and just search a Hong Kong job board and you'll find that a lot of the roles state as a prerequisite Chinese speaking. And by Chinese speaking, they want Mandarin these days. It's no longer enough to, to speak Cantonese. They, they want you to be fluent in Mandarin too. Because Hong Kong has become um, you know, such a, a, an important portal for business to China that that skill set is something that's become increasingly important. But that said, there are opportunities out there for people who don't speak the language. Obviously, the more senior you are, the, le the less necessary it is. Certain skill sets, which are not sales-related, also do not necessarily require Mandarin speaking skills. But if you can, it's obviously you know, desired. And believe it or not, I actually have had a lot of Western classmates who spoke better Mandarin than I did. It was actually quite embarrassing. They worked like, for the Peace Corps in China. They've set up factories there, you know, and there were European and uh, American people, very white. They're not even Asian-American, they're like American-American, like proper 
Western. Uh, I'm, I'm not racial stereotyping or anything. I'm just saying that, you know, if you really want to, there are people out there who have been able to learn Mandarin and are able to conduct business effectively in it. One of my very good friends whom I've met through the MBA program, she's Ukrainian and she speaks fluent Mandarin and she does business development for a packaging factory in China. I don't think you can get more local than that. So whatever background you're from, if you have or if you don't have the language skill, if you want to learn it, it's entirely possible. And if you don't want to learn it, it will be more difficult to access certain opportunities, but there will still be opportunities. You know, as an Asian American who spent, you know, over a year trying to learn Chinese, it, it's difficult for sure. But I think that the Chinese people in Hong Kong and, and Chinese people, they really respect foreigners who come in and really try. I mean, obviously, you want to be competent. That's the goal. But even if you know, you're just going for it, they really respect that. And that makes a big difference. I, th- I would think even in a business setting as well. I entirely agree with that. So my partner, he's uh, American, and he's learning Cantonese. So it's not a very practical choice for a lot of foreigners because you only speak Cantonese in the Pearl Delta region. But him being able to converse even in basic Cantonese to order food or to, you know, inquire how are you, creates so much goodwill when it comes to work and it comes to, to just managing in a community here that, like, like you said, just showing the interest means, says to people that you care. Absolutely. So learn Chinese, <laughs> all of you guys <laughs> yeah. who, and girls who want to come to, to Hong Kong or China to, to study business. So a couple last questions. This is kind of a repeated question, but again, what, what do you think is the biggest advantage of going to an Asian B school? I think to sum it up, the first one is obviously the insight to Asia, right? Second is, I mean, beyond the insights to Asia, is, is I think this, the, the most in- interesting one is the access to high growth opportunities. I think this is probably, you know, the, similar with Asia and with LATAM and most of the fast-growing economies, that being in those, in those countries means that you're able to see what's really happening um, on the ground, how things are evolving, and things are evolving very, very fast. I was in India just uh, um, a week ago, and it's just shocking to see how quickly they've picked up, you know, and how much interest there is right now in entrepreneurship, in tech, how many overseas uh, Indians are coming back to India to grow the economy and things like that. And you, you see this happening at a pace of, of not 10 or 20 years, but in terms of months, Right, so every trip that I make back to India, something has changed. The market has changed. The sentiment has changed, and so it's really you know you really need to stay very close to the ground, talking to people a lot, and to, and be really plugged into how these things are happening. And if that's something that you like and you enjoy, you know, being being part of this this fast growing, high growth story, um, I think Asia is really a great place to be. Um, the other part is, you know, the nature of because it's it's growing so fast and. So many of the MBA programs in Asia are still in its nascent stages. It also means there's a lot of opportunity for you to come and to influence things. I think it's very hard as a, for example, a student at Wharton or Columbia, where you have a hundred plus year history, to go in there and say, I want to influence the school and make it better. It's already pretty good, right? Whereas in schools like, um, you know, not just HKUST, but HKU, UHK, NUS, we still have a very nascent program we still have a very short history so there's a lot of room for opportunity to to do new things so HQAC for example two years ago we started uh, partnering with MetLife to do a MetLife challenge which is it's just a fun event like you do like an amazing race around Hong Kong with the staff of MetLife it's a way to interact with uh, MetLife and to build relationships and to access opportunities with them but at the same time it's an opportunity for MetLife partners to learn about what the millennium generation wants, you know, how we think, how we behave. And, and, and that's something that's very exciting that only happened in the last two years. This year is the first year that we're hosting the Bomb and Mercier uh, Global, Global MBA Challenge. And these are things that, you know, came up based on initiative from students, initiatives by the school. And I'm sure there's a lot more things like that to come. And there's so much more space to create things like that here in Asia that I think... You, will not prob- you probably will not get in the more developed schools elsewhere. I think you really hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's 
to go to Asia, which is a frontier of business, and to go to an Asian business school, which is you know at the frontiers of of business school, you have to have a certain uh, open mindedness, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, but also that hustle muscle and initiative, right? To really just make things happen, because that in the end, that's what you're doing. You just make it happen, right? You just got to make it happen. So I think that's really interesting to hear. And my last question is. Do you have any last advice for applicants to top Asian business schools, having been through the whole thing? I'll start with first uh, uh, an advice for MBA candidates in general. I'm also an active uh, volunteer to, you know, in helping my MBA school recruit uh, students. And something that I've, I've come to learn over speaking to, I think, almost, almost 100 MBA candidates is, I think a lot of students, when it comes to budgeting for the MBA program, I feel that there's not enough thought put into how much you need to budget for that time after the program when you're still looking for a job. An MBA program these days no longer guarantees a job. I think the only B schools I know where a job is almost guaranteed are the IIMs in India because you know they have such a strong reputation, there's such a high demand. For the rest of us, you know, I think the job search could stretch anywhere between a few months to maybe up to a year, depending on how particular you are and, and what you're looking for. And that's something I think candidates should think about broadly. Any candidate to any business school should think about and factor into their budget, especially when you're thinking about the very expensive business schools where fees and the, the, the program in itself is really quite pricey. And then you want to factor in that, that search time. That's, that's a lot to think about, right? The second advice I would have is to pick a school that best fits you. And by that, I mean don't pick a school just based on the brand and don't pick a school just based on the potential financial upside that you're going to get. I think that's the traditional thinking that a lot of us have had going to an MBA program. But as MBA programs become more ubiquitous, MBA degrees become more commonplace, you're going to want to think about what value add is it going to provide you beyond the additional qualification. And if you're able to go into an MBA program with, um, with the goal of something beyond financial gains, I think you'll find that it's a lot more rewarding, it's a lot more satisfying to come out of that, to know that, hey, you know, you know, like for me, it was about personal learning, about finding something more about myself, expanding my network. And the relationships I have today, the things that I've learned, uh, the, the exposure that I've gotten through, through the experience has, has made me feel that, uh, you know, my entire experience has completely exceeded, well, well completely exceeded by my time at HKUST, Right. If I had just tied it to monetary gains, I think that's a very narrow definition of it. Plus, the return is not going to, you're not going to see that for the first two, three years, right? It's, it's a long-term thing. But it's frustrating sometimes to talk to some people and they're so quick to dismiss that, oh, you know, I really regret making this choice, it, it, going to B school because I spent so much money, I didn't get the job that I wanted and, and this and that. But there was so much more beyond that. And if you go into B school, Keeping the, your mind open to capture an experience that's beyond the, the academics and the curricula, that's what you'll find that you gain a lot much more. You you gain much more, and you'll enjoy the experience a, a whole lot more as well. Wow, that's really profound. Yeah, because we don't we really don't hear that much. Uh, I don't hear that much. Yeah, and you know, obviously, a lot of the MBA media doesn't really talk about that much as well. You know, it's all about ROI and ranking and brand and money in, money out. But it is, you're right, it is uh, a year or two years to really grow as a person. You have this, this chance to step back, right, from, from the real world, so to speak, and to really develop yourself. It is. I think it's a legitimate way to take time off to reflect. And I think this is something that I personally feel that MBA schools are not doing enough to talk about. People are not discussing enough about. No one wants to admit that you know, MBA programs are becoming so much more common. It's become, it's become so hard to differentiate. So B schools are not going to tell you that. As a recent alumni, I'm going to say this is something I think more people should think about, especially as um, everyone's trying to differentiate. So it's a good time to step back and think of, to really dig deep about who you are. Do alumni get extra time in Hong Kong after they graduate to look for jobs? Because you mentioned that that could be three months to one year. Yeah, we do. So that's a great question, Darren. Thanks for posing it because it's something, again, I think a lot of these schools and candidates don't, don't think enough about. 
In Hong Kong, for example, all graduates from Hong Kong universities, upon graduation, we qualify for something called a IANG visa. It's a special visa that is specifically catered to graduates from local universities. And this allows you a time up to one year to find a full-time employment in Hong Kong. Um, you don't need to be, to be employed during this time of search, but it buys you, you know, a valuable time to, to find a job. And when you do find a job, you, know, you can opt to stay on that scheme because you're technically identified like a, as a local rather than switch to a, uh, an employment permit. So an employment permit will mean that you are tagged to your employer and when your employment ends, you have like a, a, a small window after that employment to find something new. But with the ING, let's say like for me not right now, I am on the ING. And if I choose to change my job halfway, I can stay in Hong Kong for as long as that visa is valid. And this is renewable. I think at the end of this year, I can renew it for one or two years and then it can keep rolling until I, I choose to, to stay here as a permanent resident after seven years. Oh, really? So even when you're employed, you can keep extending that, I, I, what is it, I-N-G visa? I-A-N-G. I-A-N-G visa. For up to, do you know for how many years? I'm not too sure, but I think there are quite a number of people who have, have done this and not gone on to the work permit. I don't have the specific details. I'm not the immigration department, but I'm sure you You're can not. find it. You're not. Come on. No. <laughs> I may sound like I know a lot, but it's not, <laughs> it's not that much. Uh, but yeah. you know, coming back to this topic, um, I think immigration and rights to work in a certain country is becoming something that employers are more particular about, that I think people don't talk about enough. For example, in the US, what surprised me a lot while I was at Columbia is the number of international students that were there. And you know, I think a lot of them were disappointed because they went to the US you know, getting this fantastic education hoping to stay, but realizing how difficult it was to get a H-1 visa or you know, whatever papers it is that they needed to stay in the U.S. The opportunities available to have a visa sponsor in the U.S. were restricted to a certain category or a certain type of uh, jobs. And I think this is something that's cropping up more and more even in Europe and other parts of Asia. And that's something that people need to think about. For example, the top MBB schools these days Increasingly, they are asking for candidates to apply back to their country of origin. They don't want, or as much as possible, they try to reduce sponsoring work visas. And it's the same with a lot of large corporations. So if you are a European passport holder in Hong Kong, what this means is you have one year's time to find a job in Hong Kong and you can find a job in Europe. But if I went to LBS or INSEAD in France, I don't think I would have had that same level of, of luxury. I've had friends who have done... Asian passport, Indian passport holders who did their program in INSEAD got an offer from one of the top tech companies in the world and they couldn't, they couldn't take the job because they couldn't get the right papers for it. So it's incredibly disappointing, right? It's disheartening to, to know that. Oh, yeah, especially yeah. at that stage to get the offer. Yeah, you got the offer, you have the contract, but it all you know, bungles up in the immigration process, yeah. So, so coming back to this, things, things like this change often. And I think this makes it all the more important to talk to alumni and people who are based in those countries to understand what's going on in the job markets, to know what's, what's happening, where's immigration policy going, how difficult is it really to stay on or to get the papers, the rights to work there. So, you know, again, thanks a lot for this question because it's something that I try to talk to MBA candidates a lot of, uh, about because this is something that I think is quite commonly overlooked and of course, it becomes very frustrating to know that the opportunities you want are inaccessible by no fault of your own. No, that's, that's um, just great insight on the ground. And, you know, it makes me think we should have, that should be one of our big topics in the forum is kind of like, what's the immigration policy in your country right now? And I think that'd be really interesting to, to hear about. So thanks for bringing that up. Yuan Li, thank you again for, for your time and your insights. Uh, I'm sure... A lot of our listeners will really appreciate that. So thanks. Thanks for being on the show. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter, 
and Facebook at Touch MVA. See you soon.